Hi friends, electronics is developing at a very fast pace. Yesterday's top-end devices is already outdated and many of you probably have boxes with all kinds of computer hardware in the attic. There is nowhere to use them, but it's a pity to throw away. Today I will show you three useful designs that can be assembled from parts of old motherboards. Of course, this isn't all that can be done from the motherboard. So if you like the video, leave a feedback and the continuation will definitely come out. I think it's clear that on the motherboard most of the component is SMD and working with such components is difficult. The printed circuit boards for our designs are made using home technology and their quality is basically good. But if you want, the company PCB Way will make boards of any complexity and size, including multi layer and flexible boards for your homemade products or serial manufacturing. Just send the archive with the original Gerber file, select the necessary options, and that's all. Your order will be ready in just a couple of days from the moment it arrives. You will find a link to the PCBWay website in the description. Now, let's go to the point. There are a lot of various DC-DC converters on motherboards. Based on them, multi-phase power circuits of the processor and other nodes are built. These converters are mainly step-down, synchronous and have high efficiency. As a rule, to power the processor is used a complex multi-phase converter based on a specialized microchip. That chip through the drivers controls power field effect transistors. In some cases, separate converters can be found on the board, based on 1.8-pin SMD chip. Such microchips include a PWM controller and a control driver. So the converters based on them have a simple circuit. Today we will deal with this kind of the converter based on the APW7120 chip. In general, there are a lot of such converters on motherboards and all of them have almost the same circuit. Microchips may differ, but you can always find a datasheet and understand what it is capable of. We will make a converter that allows to charge from a car cigarette light or smartphones, tablets and any other consumers that require 5 volts for charging. In other words, a down converter from 12 to 5 volts. You may say we can buy one like that and it seems that they aren't expensive, but our converter isn't quite ordinary. Firstly, it has high efficiency due to synchronous conversion. Secondly, it has a bunch of protections, so it can compete with expensive chargers of this class. And most importantly, the output current reaches 5 to 6 amperes. So let's examine in order. The chip has a bunch of protections, including programmable overcurrent protection, under voltage and over voltage protection. It has a fixed converter frequency of 300 kHz. Pulse duty cycle adjustment from 0 to 100%. Remote control, soft start, the ability to adjust the output voltage. Oh yes, it can serve you coffee in the morning. It can control quite powerful MOSFETs. And the circuit is very simple. The required MOSFETs are also on the motherboard. One of the MOSFETs works like a diet, but because in the open state the resistance of its channel is very small, it will not heat up like diets in similar circuits. Hence, we get the higher efficiency. In the feedback circuit, there is a divider on the resistors R1 and R2, which set the output voltage. The voltage calculation formula is in the datasheet. A circuit with such values is designed for an output voltage of 1.8 volts. We recalculate the divider for a voltage of 5 volts. We will exclude the third transistor from the circuit and also remove the input throttle, leaving only the main one. Input and output capacitors must have a low internal resistance. The voltage for output capacitor can be 6.3 or 10 volts and for input one, 16 volts. All this, along with the rest of the small components, can also be found on the motherboard. Pay attention to one point. Our circuit has two power inputs. In theory, they can be combined together, but practice has shown that it is advisable not to do so. 
I advise to power the PWM from a low voltage of 5 to 6 volts using an additional voltage stabilizer. 5 volt stabilizers can also be found on the motherboard. The question arises, can under voltage supply of PWM lead to a problem of voltage control for MOSFETs? In fact, no, because these MOSFETs work great with such a voltage on the gate. In the divider, which sets the voltage, it is necessary to use resistors with a tolerance of 1%. Unfortunately, I had only a 5%, so the output voltage isn't 5 volts, but slightly lower. Efficiency on average was about 85%. The highest efficiency of 92% was obtained with an input voltage of 7 to 8 volts. The converter fulfills short circuit perfectly so that I can safely recommend it. A few words about the components. Transistors are selected with a drain source voltage of 20 to 30 volts, open channel resistance of 20 or less milliohm under a source gate voltage of 4.5 volts. The throttle on circuit is 1.5 microhenry. To obtain an output voltage of 5 volts, I advise you to increase the inductance at least to 10 microhenry. With such value, the efficiency will be higher. Initially, a native throttle was used. But as already said, with it the efficiency was lower. Then I took another, a yellow white ring of powder iron. The dimensions are now in front of you. The winding is wound with a wire of 1.5 mm. Such cores can be found in computer power supplies. Ferret rings aren't suitable for this purpose if they are without gap. When using non-SMD electrolytic capacitors, it is better to solder them on the upside of the board and not on the track side, as I did. All power pads must be reinforced and generously tinned. It is also worth tinning the areas on which fats are installed. This will help heat dissipation. Feeds don't need an additional heat sink. The second device. I was glad when I saw on one of the motherboards the chip with the numbers 358 and on the other a small part marking 431 because these are the good old analog microcircuits. The first is an LM308 dual operational amplifier, only more economical and the second is a TL431 voltage reference. On motherboards, as it has already become clear, there are a lot of power sources and in their bundle there are low resistance resistors, in particular 1 ohm. For our next project, we need 8 such resistors, the previously mentioned microcircuits, a pair of field effect transistors, several small resistors and capacitors from the motherboards. Here is a diagram. This USB load allows you to check the real current characteristics of all kinds of power banks or chargers with a voltage of 5 volts. This device loads the test source with an output current of up to 3 amps. Moreover, the current is stabilized and it is possible to regulate it in the range from 0 to 3 amps. In fact, our circuit consists of two similar loads connected in parallel. Let's quickly examine the principle of work. We have a low resistance current sensor or a shunt. The power transistor is controlled by an operational amplifier. A reference voltage is applied to its direct input through a divider. That reference voltage is constantly compared with the voltage drop on the shunt. An operational amplifier always tries to reduce the voltage difference between its inputs to zero by changing its output voltage. If the reference voltage at the direct input is greater than the voltage drop at the shunt connected to the inverse input, the operational amplifier will increase its output voltage. The field effect transistor will open slightly, which will reduce the resistance of its open channel. This will increase the current in the circuit and increase the drop on the shunt. This will continue until the current in the circuit reaches the value at which the drop on the shunt will be equal to the reference voltage at the direct input. The circuit operates in linear mode, that is, transistors and shunts will heat up much, so the power of the circuit is limited by the transistor housing. Although our transistors are powerful but in linear mode, the maximum that they are capable of is a modest 10 to 15 watts. I strongly advise you not to exceed these values. I will repeat, I mean linear mode. 
The printed circuit board has massive polygons for heat dissipation. I chose the two-sided board. The second side will be an additional heat sink. The heat from the transistor should have been transferred to it through a copper foil, which I was going to solder, but I couldn't find the foil. To work for a long time at maximum power, it needs an additional radiator, which can be taken from the same motherboard. Moreover, it is absolutely necessary to use such thermal pads with a high coefficient of thermal conductivity. They will compensate irregularities that form after manual thinning of the surface. I don't advise saving on cooling in such things. The variable resistor responsible for adjusting the current is the only part that was not from the motherboard. After assembly, it is necessary to check board to make sure that there are no bad connections and shorts. Only after that, we proceed to the test. We connect our load to the power bank through the USB tester, which will show the output characteristics. Slowly rotate the current regulator and see that everything is working. The maximum load current will be about 3 amps with these values of components. You can do a little more, but this is already dangerous for the load itself, so the current is limited at this level. Thus, the maximum power dissipated by the load is about 15 watts. My power bank confidently gives these 3 amps, which isn't surprising. It was redone and capacity is increased. Thus, if at the current declared by the manufacturer, the output voltage of the charger or power bank drops or they completely turn off, then that devices aren't so cool. You can also make stress tests, see what happens to your chargers during long-term operating at maximum currents, evaluate heating and work in general. So USB load is a useful thing. And finally, the third design is a device that will automatically turn on, for example, a cooling system if the temperature on the monitored surface is higher than a specified limit. In other words, it is an automatic thermal switch or thermal solid state relay. When overheating, such a device will allow start, for example, the fan in your computer, power supply, and so on. The circuit is simple and built on the basis of a dual voltage comparator LM393, which was found on one of the motherboards. To adjust the operating temperature of the circuit, a multi-turn turning resistor is used, which isn't taken from the motherboard. It will have to be bought or found in the other old electronics. The same can be said about the temperature sensor. This is an NTC thermistor. By the way, these can be found on laptop battery control boards. First, I note that our comparator with an open collector, that is, it can provide switching only by the minus of source. In other words, its output is either low or nothing. At low level, the transistor is closed. A high level is provided by an additional pull-up resistor. In idle mode, the output of the comparator is low. When the thermistor heats up to a threshold value, the comparator is turned off, or rather changes the state of the output. If earlier we had a low level, now nothing. It is then that the transistor will work. It will work due to the previously mentioned resistor, which will provide a plus on the gate and will open transistor. A load is connected to the drain circuit of the transistor. Because the field effect transistor in this circuit works in switch mode, that is, it is either open or closed, loads can be powerful. This switch practically doesn't heat up. That is, it can withstand a bunch of fans, even powerful. In other respects, the operation of this circuit isn't very different from the electronic load, which was considered earlier. A voltage is supplied to the direct input of the comparator through a divider. One of the resistors of the divider is trimmer and will allow you to adjust the reference voltage and, in general, the response temperature of the circuit. At the inverse input, there is also a divider, one of the resistors of which is an NTC thermistor. When the thermistor is heated, its resistance decreases, that is, the voltage at the inverse input decreases. The comparator changes the state of the output and what happens next has already been explained. The adjustment is simple. We heat the thermistor to the required temperature, for example 70 degrees. Next, by rotating the tuning resistor, we achieve the operation of the fan. 
The circuit has some switching hysteresis, that is, if, for example, it worked at 70 degrees, then it will turn off only if the thermistor has cooled to 50 to 55 degrees. This video is coming to an end. If it was interesting, then don't forget to rate it. All the necessary information, including the archive with the printed circuit boards, as always are in the description. Now, I say goodbye, until we meet again, with you as always, was Kaysian TV.